Hello and welcome to this event on reaching net zero. Is the tax system ready? I'm the IFG's Chief Economist Gemma Tetlow and I'm delighted that we're partnering on this event with Deloitte. We've had a really busy autumn of net zero announcements with the government's new strategies and the COP26 meetings, but the budget was perhaps surprisingly quiet on the subject of net zero, given how much the tax system can and must do to help with this transition. So it's great to come together today to discuss whether the UK tax system is ready. We at the IFG put out a report on this recently, highlighting the issues that need to be tackled, including replacing the roughly one and a half percent of GDP of revenues that are likely to disappear as we transition away from polluting behaviours, and also the mess of inefficient incentives that the tax system provides for climate friendly behaviour. And we're joined today by four external experts to help us discuss this topic. We have in alphabetical order, the Right Honourable David Gork, Head of Public Policy at McFarland's LLP, and former Financial Secretary to the Treasury. James Murray MP, who is Shadow Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Chris Stark, who is Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee. And Amanda Tickle, who is Head of Tax Policy and Trade Policy at Deloitte UK. Before we get started, a few brief housekeeping notes for you. Please do start sending in your questions using the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screen. If you see a question that's already in there that's similar to one you wanted to ask, please just up like it so we know that it's popular. And if you're happy to add your name and where you're tuning in from, please do so because it's always interesting to know who we're talking to. We'll be live tweeting this event from at IFG events using the hashtag IFG net zero. So please do follow and tweet along. This event is on the record and the video and sound recording will be available on our website within 24 hours. But without further ado, let's come to our panelists. Amanda, let me start with you. The UK is not the only country looking to get to net zero. What are other countries doing on this front and how does the UK compare? Thank you, Gemma, and hello. So look, assessing and comparing those tax measures related to net zero is quite a challenge because they're just not categorised like this. So it gives us an obscure picture of what's going on. There's a wider range uh, of taxes, reliefs, incentives used by the UK and other countries, and they include things like air passenger duty, congestion charging, capital allowances, grants, payments of planting trees and emission trading systems. So to try and bring some order to this, I'm going to focus on three areas um, cars, innovation and carbon pricing. So I chose cars because there's actually a pretty long list of measures used by the UK and other countries at the moment. Um, to reel off a few here in the UK, there's a two and a half thousand pound grant for new electric cars, more for vans and HGVs, a 350 pound grant for a home charge point, a large 90% discount in benefit and kind tax on company cars, enhanced capital allowances. There's a scrappage scheme offered by councils like London and Birmingham. There's relief from road tax for electric cars and conversely a higher tax charge for heavy emitters. There's no congestion charge for electrics and a new ultra high emission charge. And of course, fuel duty at just under 58p a litre. So in all, there's actually quite a collection in the UK and it might be contributing to the rising number of low emission cars sold, which was 15% year to date. But Let's just compare that to Norway, where last year the figure was 77%. Now, Norway have similar tax measures to the UK. Again, a big range from no road tax to reduced tolls. But there's one major difference. They use the VAT system to dramatically reduce the cost of cars. So the VAT went from 25% to zero. And it looks like this point of sale cost reduction has made a real difference. Now, two other international examples, France really focuses on grants, but gives much more generous ones, up to 14,000 euros if you combine, combine grant, scrappage and use the car in a low emission zone. And in the US, they take a different approach and they use an income tax credit system so you can deduct up to seven and a half thousand dollars from your tax bill. And interestingly, President Biden's just proposed a big increase here of an extra five thousand dollars deduction if the car was made in America. So that's cars. Now, turning to incentives for investment and innovation in the UK, there are enhanced capital allowances, incentives for cars, as I said, but you know, otherwise that broader allowance for installing new energy and water efficient equipment, which which gives a 100 percent deduction in the first year ended in 2020. And generally R&D relief, 
patent box regime, the 130% super deduction are not focused on net zero or energy efficiency. And as you said, Gemma, in the autumn budget, most commentators were expecting more measures here. And we just saw a small new relief from business rates to start from 2023. Now, I would say elsewhere in the world, R&D regimes are being used more widely for net zero. So just take the EU Green Deal. Um, about 35% of Horizon Europe program, which is the R&D program, is specifically allocated to addressing climate change. And in the US at state level, uh, the Californian home of Tesla, for instance, offers really generous R&D incentives and outspends all other states in R&D. And Biden's new Build Back Better proposals include more use of tax credits and a billion dollars to research energy innovation. And third and lastly, a quick look at pricing carbon. Of course, the UK has an emissions trading system, so there is a cost of carbon. I won't go into detail, but just to say the UK's current price a tonne is around 62 pounds, which is higher than the EU's at 69 euros. But some EU countries add specific taxes on top. Uh, Sweden went furthest and imposed a fossil fuel tax on top of the excise system and now price, prices carbon at the highest rate in the world at 114 euros a tonne. The thing is though, ETS is only focused on territorial emissions, uh, which brings me to a brand new invention the EU is, in, is now proposing. It's specifically not described as a tariff or tax, but I would say it does have the same effect, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And what this aims to do is for specific carbon intensive imports like cement, aluminium, steel, a charge like a tariff would be levied at the point of import. Now, this is a new concept. The UK has yet to explore a CBAM, but it was actually discussed briefly at COP26. In fact, it was one of the few times tax was mentioned with countries being supportive of a unilateral approach. But, you know, this could be a long way in the future. Um, and so in just a few minutes, that sets the tax scene. And I would say there's a huge array of existing uses of the tax system by the UK and other countries around the world but it's not easy to decipher. Thanks very much, Amanda. Chris, coming to you next, the CCC has looked at all aspects of the net zero challenge, including issues around the tax system. What's your take on what's needed and how quickly do we need to make these changes in the UK? Yeah, thanks, Gemma. And thanks, Amanda, too. That was very useful uh, uh, skirting around all these issues. There's so many. Um, I, I mean, I, we can dip into all of that. I mean, just maybe two or three points from me coming from the analysis that we've done. Um, the first thing is a fairly fundamental point, actually, that um, it's an interesting moment. It's always an interesting moment if you work on climate change, but it's a particularly interesting moment right now. Um, we have the new net zero strategy from the government, which kind of amalgamates several sectoral strategies that we've had uh, and known about for a while. And the, and the kind of implication for tax is that, you know, we are going to have to have you know, inevitably tax reforms. And um, it's worth saying that because that's a new position to be in. Uh, just a few aspects to that. The, the environmental taxes have been um, pretty reliable revenue raisers over the years. Um, I worked in the Treasury in the early noughties and, you know, they were raising good money then. It's probably about four billion a year from various environmental taxes that the Exchequer takes. Um, the Treasury has always accepted that they will eventually have some sort of behavioural impact and that you're going to see dwindling revenues and we're really in that period now. So this next decade is going to be really critical. The major challenge isn't those small revenue raises though, it's the transport taxes. And that's why I say that, it, that there's an inevitability to tax reforms because fuel duty is 28 billion a year. Um, that's, that, that, you know, that's about a 20th of the government spending power uh, each year. Vehicle excise duty is 7 billion. Uh, dwindling revenues is a major fiscal risk. So uh, interestingly, that fiscal risk is created by the Prime Minister uh, in, in his 2030 date for phasing out the sale of internal combustion engine cars and vans. So we reckon that over the next 15 years, that 28 billion will have if we don't see any future reform. And that doesn't seem credible at the moment. So really interesting where we go next with the transport taxes. The economists have always favoured road pricing, of course, but politically that's always been very difficult. There is a dusty folder in the Treasury uh, transport team's desk talking about the importance of road pricing that I'm afraid has never made its way to any kind of announcement by uh, a Chancellor. 
Uh, there are other ways to look at this, but we're going to have to open it up. So it's interesting to see, for example, congestion charging being flagged again by the Infrastructure Commission for their work programme over the next couple of years. Really, really kind of key thing there is, is clearly we're going to have to look at how we tax transport in a low carbon transport world that we're now heading very rapidly towards. So that my, my first point was really about that, the inevitability of tax reforms. The second point is a more, uh, you know, a general point, I suppose, that carbon pricing still has a very important role to play in this transition, but of course it's regressive. And um, there aren't really any easy answers here for ministers. Um, but interestingly, we've already been promised consideration of one of the major issues, which is this challenge on energy bills. Um, we have at the moment, put very simply, uh, an electricity bill that has lots of the uh, uh, policy costs that have helped to pay for the decarbonisation of electricity, of course, sitting there. And on the gas bill, all the tax discounts that uh, we've used for a long time uh, on the fuel poverty front. Now, that creates a really interesting challenge. We, we would, we, if we could, we would flip that. <clears throat> so that idea that you know we know want to look at that as a tax change is definitely something that um, I think the ch the chancellor will have to consider. There really should be some sort of wholesale strategic review of carbon pricing and taxation, but there has never been a time when that has been politically appealing. And you can see that it's not just in this this carbon world. If you look at the Murley's review, for example, it's always difficult to do wholesale tax reforms. Treasury's notably ducked that in the last net zero review. Um, perhaps, perhaps this might be a time to consider something like a carbon tax that's more explicit and a rebate or a dividend. Uh, and that was being discussed a few months back, I remember, in the press as a means to try and limit some of those regressive impacts. But clearly some form of carbon pricing and some form of review is, is, is going to help here. And then the last point I wanted to make is a, a fundamental point that comes out of our work, which is about the distribution of the costs and the benefits of this transition. Uh, it's a it's a distributional question in many ways, but the way in which we have looked at this uh, in the CCC is, is by sector. And of course, we are very clear that the aggregate cost of achieving net zero to the economy is now quite low uh, because principally it involves large upfront capital investments and then a growing oper operational saving to the whole economy from using all that low carbon technology which is much more efficient typically uses cheaper and cheaper electricity means we're spending less and less on imported fossil fuels but no one experiences the aggregate impact and that's you know an interesting and important point to make that the major challenge is that there are some sectors where the transition is really cheap or even cost saving so you can look at the energy sector, the transport sector, for example, and then there are others where you've got very large costs. You've got buildings and industry especially, and they're politically very difficult. So that's a classic fiscal challenge. That's something the Chancellor could choose to do something about by spreading the costs and the benefits more fairly, perhaps using tax policies. We'll need to level the playing field for industry especially. So again, not clear that he is keen to do that in recent publications. So if you draw all that together, the final point I wanted to make really is that let's assume we have an election in 2023, which seems to be where the pundits are, 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 are declaring. Um, any major tax reforms would probably have to uh, probably have to come in the year after that to have their strongest political footing. So we really should now be in a very deep period of thought about some of those big tax changes that we've covered already in this in this call. Um, building the case for that it, it, among the commentariat, among the opinion formers outside of government, that really does need to start now if we're going to hit that that window in it, it, you know in the next few years. But th that's a question at the moment. I don't really feel that that's happening. So uh, that's going to have to start warming up now if we're going to hit that kind of window overall, Gemma. Thanks very much, Chris. David, coming to you, you are the minister in, in charge of tax policy for many years. How high up the agenda was net zero for you? And, and Chris has touched on some of those political challenges, but how did you see the, those kind of obstacles to doing any of the things that Chris talked about? If it probably wasn't high enough uh, up the agenda and, and certainly since I left the Treasury in 2017 it is risen up the political agenda a great deal but it still seems to me that we're somewhere away from a coherent position on this. Um, there are political reasons why that that is the case and, and, and I think you know the fundamental challenge for politicians and this applies both to the government and to the opposition uh, is that there isn't really a willingness to say to the public that the transition from where we are to a net zero economy uh, 
um, is going to be a significant one that will have you know quite considerable costs. Now, Chris makes the point that you know over the long term, uh, those co costs might not be that great, but certainly we're going to require very substantial behaviour change. Uh, it seems to me that if you uh, want to do this and deliver on net zero, um, you want to do that in as efficient a manner as possible. Uh, and that means I think you have to properly price carbon that is going to enable you to more efficiently redistribute resources in the way that you need to uh, as if you like a market based solution to many of the challenges uh, that we face. Um, but if you're going to price carbon, then it becomes very transparent to the public that this isn't all just win, 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 that this isn't all about new jobs and new opportunities. Yes, there'll be new jobs and there'll be new opportunities, but there are going to be quite a lot of upfront costs and you are going to have to have sticks as well as carrots. And, and that is something which is very difficult for any politician to admit to. And at the moment, public engagement on uh, net zero um, isn't really taking the bold political risks necessary to communicate. Now, my worry is that if you don't um, take those bold, ambitious uh, risks and communicate with the public, you either end up with policies that are ineffective uh, or policies which are inefficient and unnecessarily costly. Um, uh, and and you, know, you 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 end up with a choice of of either failing to pursue a net zero uh, policy uh, with any real um, enthusiasm, or the whole thing runs into public opposition and collapses. Uh, and that's where I think you do have to be sort of pretty open with the public. Um, you are then left also if you go down a proper carbon pricing policy, which, as I say, we're a long way away, it seems to me, um, then you are left with challenges about the regressive nature of it uh, that can be dealt with. There are perfectly sensible ways in which one can address it, but it's, you know, it's a it's a big step. And I think it's a long, long way away from where the, the, the public is. Um, I'm not I don't entirely blame the Treasury for this. This is a really, really big political call that has to be made by the Prime Minister, first of all, is, you know, how open are we going to be? Um, you know, are we going to level with the fact that we've got to change behaviour fairly significantly? We're going to have to use uh, a lot of levers to do that. We, we will have to use the tax system as a lever to do that, which means, you know, some people will be paying more in tax for behaving as they currently do. Um, if if a government as a whole is prepared to uh, make the, that choice, then it seems to me that I suspect that the Treasury will know exactly what it needs to do and, and, and it will pursue the type of carbon pricing policy that the, you know, the Institute for Government advocates or the Institute for Fiscal Studies advocates, uh, as economists tend to advocate sort of across across the board. Uh, you know, a carbon pricing policy makes a great deal of sense. Um, the, challenge is, is a political one and you have to step away from the kind of the, the the intricacies of what technically you should be doing and how do you work it out and you know what do you do to compensate the poorest how do you deal with carbon leakage and that takes us back to Amanda's point earlier about um, carbon border adjustment mechanisms all of which are very important and no doubt we'll discuss today um, but, it, but it all lies essentially with that big political choice that as far as I can see no one is yet prepared to say um, this comes with costs it it's going to need sticks as well as carrots and that the tax system will be central in terms of delivering that. Um, you know, once politicians uh, are prepared to admit that and I, you know, as a former politician, I have sympathy with some of the political challenges that they face here. But until and unless they're prepared to admit that, I don't think you will have a coherent approach to tax and net zero. Thank you very much, David. James. You as Shadow Financial Secretary are obviously sitting within the Labour team thinking about Labour's potential future policies on this area. What's your take on the Treasury's recent announcements on tax and net zero and what would a Labour led Treasury be doing differently? So th thanks for having me along today and it's, it's really it's really interesting to listen um, to the other contributors um, as well. Um, I think what I would like to do is just set out a little bit of the context uh, of how we in the opposition um, see the landscape here, because 
I think the conversation around taxation um, when you're talking about responding to the climate emergency um, has to consider growth and investment um, at the same time. And this has been really important for us uh, in responding to the recent budget um, and for me uh, leading on the finance bill, uh, which had its second reading um, last week. And, you know, I want to set out what our, our position is. I'm, I'm going to avoid uh, being too party political about it, but there obviously are differences in terms of uh, our view of the economy uh, and what should be done uh, to secure growth um, in the coming years. And the argument that we were putting forward in response to the budget and that I was putting forward uh, in the finance bill second reading um, is that if you look at the, the last 10 years, we've had low growth, uh, which has meant that now uh, the government's hand is being forced uh, into raising taxes. Um, now, there's a separate debate around how they choose to raise taxes, and there's plenty of uh, discussion we can have about that. Um, but the central argument uh, that we've been uh, prosecuting is that a decade of low growth has led to higher taxes, and the prospect for growth uh, is not uh, strong looking forward. Um, and so from our point of view, if you want to have a sustainable uh, tax revenue and you want to make sure you can invest in public services, uh, we need to grow the economy. If you think about growing the economy, you then very quickly and immediately come to a question of how do you grow the economy um, in a sustainable way, um, in a way that responds to the climate emergency. Um, and that's where uh, the uh, the commitment set out by Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor, uh, fits in, uh, that we in the opposition uh, want to see £28 billion of additional investment every year for the rest of this decade um, in the green transition. Um, and by the green transition, uh, which sounds which can sound abstract when you're talking about it to people, you know, we mean investment in uh, factories, uh, building the batteries for new electric vehicles. Uh, we mean investing in our homes uh, to make them well insulated and bring down fuel bills. We mean investing um, in British industries uh, who are taking the lead um, on net zero uh, development. So from our point of view, that investment, that £28 billion additional uh, investment every year for the rest of this decade um, is crucial to not only combating the climate emergency, but also to growing the economy, uh, thereby making sure people have more money in their pockets, um, but also making sure you've got greater tax revenue uh, to spend on day to day uh, services. And what we were concerned about in terms of the, the government's budget and the government's current position um, is that, as I said, low growth and, and high tax, uh, but also no plan uh, for uh, investment on the scale that's needed uh, to really transform uh, the economy um, and the country um, in line with the net zero um, obligations. And the argument that, that I was making last week and that and Rachel Reeves and other colleagues have made too, um, is that actually, although climate change is an absolutely urgent um, emergency, it's necessary to respond to it for all sorts of reasons, um, there is also an opportunity uh, to create good new jobs um, and to make sure that we create good new jobs in every part of the country um, and we should start seeing the investment which is necessary uh, to combat climate change as a way of growing the economy and thereby increasing um, tax revenue and you know I think the overall conclusion uh, from us in terms of looking at the budget and the announcements made around that um, is that there was no uh, level no investment package on the scale required um, and if you look at the signals that were sent over taxation. Um, I mean, I have to say, I was sat there in the, on the front bench, I almost had a double take when the Chancellor said, we're going to cut air passenger duty for domestic flights. Um, you know, what kind of message does that send uh, in terms of um, people's behaviour? So from our point of view, the budget was in the wrong place um, and the, uh, the plans for the future are not going in the right direction. Um, and for what we would do differently um, is make sure we grow the economy through that extra investment of a really significant scale uh, needed to transform the economy um, and the country. And on the back of that sustainable growth, uh, we would increase not only the money in people's pockets, uh, but also the tax revenue that we need for public services. Thanks very much, James. Um, I'd like to start by picking up on a point that I think James and David, you are both um, touching on there. There's, there's one question about how much tax revenues the government needs to raise overall and James your case is that a Labour government would have more effective growth policy and therefore may not need to be looking for extra tax revenue raising but there's another question here which is about how the tax system incentivizes people to do less polluting activities and I think that's part of what you David were getting at that the, 
politicians haven't yet been willing to have that conversation with people to say, actually, the cost of things that you've traditionally liked to do is going to have to go up to discourage you from doing those things and to shift people over to less polluting activities. So I just wonder, particularly probably a question for you, David and James, whether you think there is any scope for more cross party working and consensus here that both the Conservatives and Labour want to get to net zero, is there common ground that the message could go out to the public that things are going to have to get more expensive in things they used to like to do and that their behaviour is going to have to change? I, I think it would be very helpful if that could happen. There, there, there are certain risks with that um you know, if you are one of the participants and you know the history of public policy is full of examples where wouldn't it be nice if you know we could all get in a room and agree on what we want to do and you know there's a shared objective and, and let's go and do it and 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 it doesn't happen very often it can un it can unravel the risks actually I th on this one i think are probably greater for the conservative party uh, because if the Conservatives and Labour got together and said, look, you know, these activities, we are not properly you know, incorporating the externalities that ought to be in the price. We, we should be putting up taxes in this particular area. I think it's probably the Conservatives who will be more worried that they will be then sort of outflanked from 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 from, you know, somewhere whether it's its own backbenchers whether Steve Baker would be leading a revolt and saying you know do that and you're just you know you're engaging in some elite conspiracy that leaves the public you know disenfranchised and there's no proper choice etc cetera, etc cetera. you can you can hear the arguments um and um to, to which I think my point is not that there shouldn't be cooperation between uh, the main parties um, but it is also necessary to communicate, to explain. You can't just impose this on people. You have to set out the case as to why you're doing it, recognise that you know this does come with certain costs, uh, and do what you can to, to protect uh, the poorest, protect the most vulnerable from, the, from those costs. Um, but you've still got to um, you know, own up. Uh, the, this is a this is a transition that comes with certain consequences, and it's not all win win win. It's not all about new jobs and new opportunities. It's also about you know certain costs and 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 people having to bear those costs. I just like to jump in. I was waiting to be uh, Gemma. I'll, I'll just jump in whilst uh, the connection sorts itself out. Um, yes. No. I. I mean. I think. You know, there's, there is there is obviously um, a, a call from people uh, to work together on the big challenges we face, and I think that you know any, everyone in politics would like to work together uh, where possible. Um, I think we also need to be honest in that the reason we have politics is because there is disagreement. <laughs> you know, there are different views on how you tackle the big challenges we face, and I think a lot of the uh, issues we face uh, with with climate change and with the way that the economy and so on are going to change are going to have big impacts on people's lives. So um, I don't, you know, I'm not seeking to sort of defend, uh, you know, um, unnecessary pol politicking. Um, but there is uh, there is politics here. You know, there are there are big choices to be made and, and different visions um, to set out. So in defence of politics, <laughs> if you like, there is a there is a discussion um, to be had there about about how all of this um, goes through and. You know, I think it's I think it's right and fair for us in the opposition, and in fact, our duty um, to 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 make criticisms where we think uh, the direction is is wrong or where the message being sent out is wrong. So, you know, I mentioned earlier the air passenger duty on domestic flights. It it just seems that's a very uh, you know a message which goes against the grain of, of where we should be heading uh, to cut air passenger duty, particularly followed by. Uh, you know, less investment in the railways uh, just a week later. So I think there is a there is a, 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 a there is a need for politics here uh, to make sure that we have those arguments in public. Thanks, James. Um, one of the things that we've sort of advocated for in our work is that for the Treasury to publish a net zero tax strategy that goes beyond looking just at the sort of very labelled environmental taxes to encom encompass the whole way in which the tax system prices carbon and incentivizes different activities. Chris, is that something you also think would be important? Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely love to see that. I just doubt that we'll, we will ever see it. <laughs> so on every occasion when the Treasury's had the opportunity to do something like that, it's, it's, 
it's kind of mumbled a bit and not not delivered. So it's it, I, I think it, it these big reforms are really exciting for people like me, and I suspect most of the people on this call, but they tend not to have political sweeties at the end of it. So I think the, the, the point I was trying to make in my earlier comments is that there is a burning platform here now. So it's an interesting moment for those of us who care about tax policy because there is inevitable tax reform coming. Um, and I just hope that when that happens, that we don't, um, you know, fall into the trap of just trying to, you know, plug holes rather than actually doing something a bit more fundamental. I, I tend to think that given the size of the revenue that comes, especially from fuel duty, that we will need to do something strategic. And already you can see, though, you know, the, the bones of something there from the government. So one of the things that was published shortly before COP26 in the government's net zero uh, pack of strategies that they published was this promise to look at the um, consumer bills for energy, which is a tax policy question, actually. So, you know, already you've got a transport tax policy question and an energy tax policy question uh, as far as the consumer is concerned uh, in out in the open as, a, as things that the, the Treasury will have to look at. But um, I mean, really, we should I, I, in an ideal world, we would be looking across the piece at the signals that we send for the consumption and use of, of carbon and fossil fuels and coming up with something better because this is a moment when we will need to look strategically at the most efficient way to raise taxes. Carbon pricing offers that and, um, you know, there is the potential to do that in a way that is not regressive if we do it in a strategic way. And if we think about making sure that those regressive impacts are managed uh, well, you know, you can imagine a world where we actually take some of those policy costs on the electricity bill, for example, into general taxation. And um, I, I hope those issues are being discussed in the Treasury. And uh, my point earlier still stands at the moment to do something strategic uh, and genuinely, uh, you know, looking across the piece is probably after the next election. But that means that the case for that needs to be built now. And um, this is perhaps the first time when I've been able to have this kind of discussion in a, in a forum like this. So we don't often have these discussions about tax policy. I think we'll probably need a few more of them. Thanks. Amanda, you've obviously looked at quite a lot of international examples. Has anywhere else taken a more strategic approach setting out a tax strategy of this sort? Um, no, I think that's a really interesting observation. It's actually quite difficult to compare these environmental or carbon taxes. And um, actually, it depends on what each country categorises as environmental taxes. The UK currently only says it has four environmental taxes with a plastic packaging tax on the way. So I think the point is nobody has a particularly coherent statement of either what they do today or where they're heading. Um, but I do agree with the Institute for Government's findings that it would be extremely helpful to not only lay out a strategy for what is going to achieve consumer behaviour change and business investment, um, but also where we're starting from. Um, and that is the most important thing. I, I think we don't actually have a very clear picture, both politically or amongst the electorate, of what the government's already doing on tax, which is quite extensive. And James and David, uh, Chris talked there about the need to sort of build support for reform ahead of the next election and then early in the next parliament introduce those reforms. Do you agree with that? How explicit do you think the parties need to be going into the next election about what their net zero tax strategy is going to be? James, I'll come to you first. Yes, well, I think there is a um, inevitable part of the um, sort of parliamentary rhythm, the parliamentary cycle. Um, I, I sound like I'm an expert. I've only been an MP for two years, so I've only seen one part of that rhythm, but <laughs> certainly having observed it and talking to others, um, I feel there is a, a rhythm to it where um, you know, the opposition party, as the opposition party, will bring forward our manifesto nearer the next election because you want to have enough time to, you know, consider all the options, um, think through uh, what what the, your response might be and then set it out as you get close to an election. Um, I think you need to, when you're doing that, you need to make sure you've got enough time to set it out so that people understand what you're offering. And then when you get in the other side, if you get in the other side, hopefully, um, we <laughs> then get on with it quickly uh, because you want to use that that window at the beginning of, of a parliament um, to implement things. Um, I mean, I I guess my the closest um, my source of knowledge for this, if you like, is is when I was my previous job working for the mayor of London, um, you know, where we developed the manifesto, uh, released it a few months before the election and then moved quite quickly to implement some of the uh, bigger measures straight after um, he, he got elected. And what I found was really helpful in that the read across might not be direct, but one of the things I found about that was that 
um, we were implementing some policies uh, on affordable housing, which um, you know caused some uh, some noise amongst the development industry of, of, of them being anxious about it. When we were really clear what we were doing, set out our plans, set out the timetable. You know, I, I spoke to lots of people in the industry explaining what we were doing, why we were doing it, and when we were going to do it. Actually, even if they didn't 100% agree with it, they could kind of live with it. Uh, because they knew what we were doing, why we were doing it, and when we were doing it. Um, so I think maybe there are some lessons from that uh, for implementing uh, things which might concern people more widely. David. Yeah, I think there's a sizable part of the electorate that when they come to vote at the next general election, 2023 or 2024, um, will be looking to vote for candidates and vote for parties that they see as taking climate change and net zero seriously and I think the question here is whether by then uh, by the time we get to the next general election will it be necessary to have some sort of coherent net zero tax policy in order to meet the bar that you are taking it seriously um, I don't think that was the case at the last general election and lots of people who were really worried about um, net zero and climate change and so on, but it wasn't particularly focused on what's your, you know, what's your tax policy and, you know, there was a race to you know, how many trees are planted and stuff like that. But, but you know, fundamentally, this is, is going to be central to any um, serious attempt to meet net zero in the time frame that everyone has signed up to. So there's just a sort of question as to whether, you know, Chris has talked about there aren't a lot of discussions about this. Um, but if if we are going to be serious about this over the course of the next couple of years, will we see a fundamental change in political debate, at which point there will be real pressure on political parties to say, yeah, OK, net zero, this is our tax strategy. And then the electorate will will examine it and see whether it, it meets the demands. If that shift doesn't happen, um, then political parties are not going to you know, take enormous risks here. They're not, this is a competitive position. They're not going to come forward and say, here is our net zero tax policy that's going to properly price carbon, et cetera, et cetera. If the other side will just be able, be able to get away with saying, oh, no, 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 this is all win, win, win. And you know, you're being a bit of a doomster or a gloomster and thinking that you know, you're going to have to increase people's taxes. It's all going to be good news. Um, and I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a combination of, of political pressures. One, the pressure to have something coherent and credible versus the, the the political pressure to only hear nice things and and which is going to be the most powerful political force at the next general election I don't know but that'll be the one that determines what political parties do. Fantastic I'll go to questions from the audience now and the first question that come in from Alistair Gunn um, is specifically addressed to Chris but if anyone else would like to come in after Chris has answered please let me know. Um, the question is does the move towards electric transport put the onus on revenue raising away from central government towards local government so congestion charges for example are localized revenue raises um what's your take on that well as ever it could um but i'm not, I'm not sure it will so I'm, I'm very much on the fence on this i mean i, I this is one of the areas uh, i'll make the same point again but it's just so important it's one of the areas where we will have to see some strategic reform so the basis of that will need to be a clearer sense of how uh, the treasury expects to raise money from the transport system, the personal transport system, and uh, we haven't got that at the moment. Um, so it's possible that you could move to a world where you are looking more to congestion charging to raise revenue. That tends, though, to be a, a, a tax lever that you are pulling because you're, you're trying to engineer a, a behavioural response. So if that's the case, then we will be looking to, I suppose, that will be a treasury that's happy to see fewer cars on the road, I suppose. Um, there are other ways of doing this, though. Road pricing is the other way, so you pay by how far you travel. Um, uh, that tend not, tends not to be a particularly popular policy for those who live in more rural constituencies. So you know, obviously you need some sort of countervailing policy alongside that. There is another world where you replace fuel duties with a duty on the electricity that goes into those cars too. It's not a, ta not a tax move that I would I would suggest is very sensible, but it's it's probably the easiest one to conceive of. Uh, something that's effectively charged at the at the pump in inverted commas, uh, the charging point. Um, I, the, the point is there's no real easy answer here. So it's an interesting theme actually generally in the work that we've been doing is that we are now moving generally away from top down approaches 
into something from my perspective much more interesting where you're seeing a lot of the change being driven by policies that are more regional and local in their outlook and I think it's fair to ask the question might might some of those policies be tax policies um, you know this is one of those areas where I think we are lacking a piece of um, authoritative work that points points the way forward and again we will think we'll need that over the next uh, two years or so. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Um, the next question then has come from Jill. Um, so she notes that the government seems to prefer an emissions trading scheme or an extension of the existing one rather than a full carbon tax. Should the government be going with that option or would a carbon tax be better? Um, Amanda, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. What's, what's the experience with other countries? What's the what's going oh. on there? I think the uh, popularity of emission trading systems is growing. We've got 38 countries around the world that have got a live system in place now. Um, and China this, this year actually announced they were going to introduce one covering about 30% of their emissions. So I think uh, plus coupled with the fact that most economists think uh, uh, pricing carbon in a system like this is, a, is an effective way of limiting use. Um, the thing I would say about emission trading systems is going back to this territoriality point. If you have a, a trading system which you mean it is more and more and more uh, expensive to actually um, emit carbon or, or use carbon in your production, then the risk is that that activity moves from your country into another one which perhaps has um, less um, aggressive climate costing policies or, or an emission trading system. So there needs to be a counter measure to it, which is what the EU are trying to do with the CBAM. But a CBAM will be very difficult to uh, implement unilaterally. So I don't think there's um, an easy choice between one or the other. And I guess it also depends on how you define what a carbon tax is. So something like a fuel duty already um, could be <laughs> Um, classified as as that. Can I pick up on, on, on that one, Gemma? I mean, it seems to me that both uh, emission trading systems and carbon taxes you know, fundamentally do the same thing. They they both price carbon, um, and and as Amanda has said, that leaves you with issues about carbon leakage and and, and so on. But putting those to one side at the moment, in terms of the sort of choice between. Uh, an emission trading scheme and, and, and a carbon tax, it strikes me that perhaps one advantage for governments of an emissions trading scheme is that it's less transparent because uh, it, it's, it's you know, the business itself has to you know, bid for the allocations. That is a cost that then goes into the price. It ends up being paid by the consumer in the end in, in much the same way. But it's not quite so transparent. So you can see the sort of political advantage. You know, it's a hit on business that gets passed on to the consumer versus a tax, which more obviously ends up on the consumer. Economically, I think it has the same impact. Um, but I mean, I, I, I could be corrected on this, but it, it, I, it strikes me that emission trading schemes seem to be you know, more bureaucratic. Um, uh, certainly on occasions they've been open to fraud. Um, I know some think that they're more open to lobbying and that you know, vested interests can kind of get in and, 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 and try and tweak the design of them. So I think there are real risks with emissions trading schemes, but I, I, I suspect that the lack of transparency um, is politically advantageous. Chris, does your work have anything to say about the effectiveness of these two approaches? Yeah, I mean, one of the oddities in the Climate Change Act is that if there is ever a change to the emissions trading scheme, then the government is required to come to us for some advice. They're not required to follow that advice. But the, um, uh, of course, leaving the EU and leaving the ETS was one of those changes. So we thought very hard about this question about which should you use? Um, and there is a, there is a, uh, just as David says, there's a, there's a real appeal to using carbon taxes because it's so clear what's going on. And we've used carbon taxes very well, actually, in one sector of the economy, which is the power sector. So we have the ETS in place, and then we top it up with a further uh, carbon tax, which has driven coal off the system, uh, along with a few other regulations. We plumped for an emissions trading scheme. And um, there's a few reasons for that, which I won't go through now, but um, one of the main reasons is that it gives some greater certainty to industry, we think, uh, and to investors, um, because it tends to be slightly longer term. 
So if you're <clears throat> if you're an investor, you are very worried about the fact that every single budget, the chancellor could potentially change that carbon tax. And history tells us that chancellors like to do just that. So the ETS gives some measure of slightly longer term outlook. Um, it can equally be changed as well. Um, but it's 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 something that people understand in the industries that are affected by it. And um, and it seems the government has plumped for that. But I know that there was a lively discussion within Whitehall about that uh, very topic. I, I think the fact that we now have the ETS, the fact that it's a UK ETS that at the moment at least has the same basis as the EU's ETS, uh, opens up the question of whether we might somehow wed these things back together again. The government has in the past talked about wedding it, uh, linking it to another ETS, uh, perhaps something in the US, perhaps even China. Uh, and that's the other advantage of using ETS is that you, you have that opportunity to try and link up with other jurisdictions. But we haven't re yet seen the pressure to do that. That may come. Thanks, Chris. The next question comes from Michelle, and I'll put this one to you, James, first, perhaps. So Michelle thinks there's been too much of a presumption in our conversation so far that the public are in favour of the measures that would be needed to get to net zero. And she thinks that some of the actual specific changes, particularly things like replacement of gas boilers with heat pumps, are actually pretty unpopular with the public. Um, so her question is, do you think the public is really as supportive as the perhaps current narrative suggests that they are? I think my my overwhelming feeling of what people want, and this is, you know, from what I read, from what I hear, from the conversations I have on the doorsteps, um, is that people want a want a plan, want a coherent plan which brings everything together and explains how we're going to change the economy or how we're going to change our homes or how we're going to change, you know, the country to make it uh, sustainable for the future. And I think you know, I think the there is there is a real advantage to coming forward with a with a plan which is on the scale uh, which is necessary and is sort of comprehensive and people can trust has that kind of credibility um, about actually making the transition um, that we need. Um, I mean, I think the other really important point, uh, which I think links to the the question there and and kind of uh, links also to what I I said in my opening remarks, um, is around seeing the opportunities for growth. Um, that all the investment uh, that is necessary uh, for the green transition uh, could produce. And I think that's an important way of making clear that this, this investment, so in, in our case, the £28 billion additional investment every year for this decade that we're proposing, um, yes, it is necessary uh, to combat the climate emergency, um, but it is also a way to invest in British industries to create decent, well-paid jobs in every part of the country um, to make sure that all parts of the country and, and, and people in different situations benefit. So um, I think, you know, I think when people hear individual measures, um, if they consider that in isolation, in some ways, that means that the discussion could get focused just on how you feel about that one measure, whereas seeing it as part of a, a wider plan and seeing the benefits um, of growth uh, for people in different parts of the country, um, I think is a, a more compelling way to make the overall argument. And Chris or Amanda, is any of the work that you've looked at give any sense of the sort of public support for these, any either specific measures or the general approach? Yeah, I mean, we, we look a lot at, at the public polling there is on this. And in general, I find that to be quite unhelpful because it looks at it, 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 it. I mean, there's lots of good polling that happens, but on the climate question, it's usually sort of framed as a question about whether whether you'd like to save the world or not. So mostly mostly people are supportive of that. Um, sometimes they would like to save the world even quicker than the government. Um, but uh, actually drilling down into that uh, to understand the preference for the changes that we'll see across society, there hasn't been that much polling of that. But we were participants in this brilliant process um, about 18 months ago, uh, the Climate Assembly, which Westminster uh, commissioned. So there was uh, uh, six or seven select committees um, in the Commons that commissioned this big, big citizens assembly uh, on uh, how to get to net zero. And um, I don't mind saying I was, I was kind of I was concerned about being part of it because I was worried it might undermine some of the uh, work that we had done, the technical work that we'd done on the numbers for getting to net zero. Quite the opposite was true. And actually, it was really interesting to take a representative group of people uh, through the process of understanding and outlining what you can do to cut emissions across the economy and then understand what what support there was for it. And in general, what we found with that group of 108 people very carefully selected is that they are supportive of all the things that you would need to do to get to net zero, but they had the luxury of having that introduced to them in such a way that you understand why we're making these changes, 
and you know something about the background to those changes and how it might happen and that's the bit that we're not doing at the moment so it's quite notable in this discussion we haven't really talked about the government's outlook on net zero too much but the, the broad outlook that we saw from the government in the net zero strategy a few weeks ago is essentially to say to industry to business it's your job to, to do all this so the government is essentially saying by and large we are asking commerce to deliver and we're also asking commerce to cut the cost for the consumer for most of these transitions it's a perfectly valid outlook um, uh, and of course if that works then you know we can have the kind of cakeism that i'm sure the prime minister would like to see from this 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 uh, this, this uh, process to net zero but um if it doesn't work we're going to have to come back to these questions about who pays how we put these kind of tax policies that we're discussing into place and I think we will we will inevitably have to do that. And I think at that point we will understand much better whether there is the public support for some of those changes. And I think if there is to be public support, then we're going to have to have some form of better uh, discussion with the public about why we're making these changes, what they entail. And very briefly uh, on this, the, the, the interesting thing for me, one of the most topical things here, of course, is the, the question of how you decarbonize the heat system in the UK. And every headline writer loves the, the, you know, the ripping out of gas boilers. Not that that will ever happen as a, as a theme to this transition. Um, really interesting, when we asked the assembly about that, they weren't really worried about which technology would replace their gas boilers. They, were, they understood entirely why we, we needed to move away from gas boilers. And they weren't that interested in the, pre the price question either, interesting. They were much more driven by how many times something would have to happen in their home, uh, whether they could trust the person who would make the change uh, and interestingly come back to one of the earlier points whether it would be local jobs uh, in that transition and whether they would have some agency over the decision for the area that they lived in and I think it's interesting that we're going to have to get into some of these things we assume in policy wonk land that everything is driven by you know the cost of things or the technology choice that's mostly what policies are, are framed up around but actually I think a lot of these other factors are more important uh, so when it comes to tax changes, I think we're probably going to have to discuss all of this in the round if it's to be a successful transition uh, across the board. Amanda. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, in terms of what Chris says about understandability, if that's a word of, of tax, I, I do think it needs to be simple and well articulated what the what the strategy is. And in particular on that one, the VAT system, I think in a few recent polls, um, is is the most well understood of the tax levers and so using that um, to a greater extent and explaining to consumers how it's going to work either incentives or increases um, would probably be advantageous and, and the thing I'd say or maybe just to build on Chris and, and also David's point earlier on job creation um, is this has got to be achieved in a combined effort between business and government and therefore incentivizing business to focus their attention on, on innovation on net zero technology. I heard someone say that 75% of the innovation needed is not invented yet. Well, how is that going to happen and how are we going to encourage that investment in the UK, linking it to attractiveness of the UK, especially given the corporate tax rate is going up from 2023. So I think there are potentially more things that could be done with the um, R&D regime, for instance, to attract uh, investment. And these decisions take a long time to come to um, fruition for business. So they need to be given a bit of a roadmap of where the government's going. Thank you. Next question is from Kevin Langford and he asks, is the UK likely to consider cooperating with the EU on introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism? Or is the politics too difficult? Um, David, I'll, can I come to you first on this? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, it seems to me that the 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 way forward on carbon border adjustment mechanisms does have to be through some form of uh, the coalition of the willing, um, and that you know there are some tricky issues here about the WTO rules, and and even if you are WTO compliant. You know, it, it it could be it could turn into quite a sort of subjective issue if the Chinese feel that they're being hardly done badly done by. Um, then I think you're gonna you know, you're gonna have some you're gonna have some real problems. So um, you know, better to work with others, better to be able to take a strong case to the WTO. Um, the easier that one can handle these issues. So certainly, there's a very very strong case for cooperation 
with the EU, given it seems to me that the direction that the EU set out in July is, is probably the direction that the UK would would need to 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 go to. Um, and by the way, you know, I, I do think, you know, a carbon border adjustment mechanism has certain political advantages in terms of, you know, people will worry that, you know, what's the point of increasing our carbon prices if, you know, if we're just going to export, you know, we're going to close down our steel industry and it'll go elsewhere. That's a perfectly legitimate point to make, um, by the way. But we shouldn't also kid ourselves that, you know, in the end, the costs of the carbon border adjustment mechanism, just like any tariff, if you like, um, will be passed on to consumers. So this is, you know, again, this is not a win-win. Um, you know, there are costs that will flow uh, from this, but but I think it is justifiable in these circumstances. If you're putting a price on carbon, you, you, it doesn't matter where that carbon is emitted. It's it's, it's about consumption, uh, and this is, you know, this is a, a perfectly justifiable and sensible measure if if done rightly, proportionately, well directed, and so on. Amanda, from your work looking at other countries, are there other countries that seem to have similar objectives that could the UK could make common cause with on a carbon border adjustment mechanism? I mean, well, the UK um, is is interested in in the CBAM. Has just started taking evidence. I think it was an environmental audit committee has taken evidence recently to have a look, but. Um, you know, definitely this is an EU invention, but I understand that Canada is looking at it, the US is looking at it, but David's quite right, countries like India and China are not, not really happy with that. And the UK is in quite a difficult position, currently striking trade deals around the world. And although it's not described as a tariff, as, as David says, for WTO rule reasons, it has the same effect of applying a tariff on the border. And we're at the same time trying to engage in tariff free trade agreements. So it's actually makes for quite a, a tricky conversation around applying a cost at, at the border. So um, look, it's a really new concept. Uh, it's literally been laid out by, by the EU and I think it will start getting debated um, much more widely in the next year or so. I'll try and squeeze one final question in before we get to the end of our time. Um, this question comes from Louise Marix Evans. Uh, the question is, is there a check that the Treasury has to use to assess the impacts of any new taxes or tax reliefs on progress towards net zero? And Chris, I'll, I'll ask you the factual question and then James, I'll come to you to ask whether that's something that a Labour government would want to put in place. Chris. So the short answer is no, there isn't. And we've been advocating this idea of a net zero test for all policy and in particular for um, new developments. We were thinking particularly about infrastructure developments there. But I have to say in recent weeks, I've become more and more convinced that it would be better if the Treasury would, would publish its own view of the impact of the decisions that it's taking. Um, uh, James mentioned earlier the the uh, the stunt that on air passenger duty, and I, th I think it was a stunt, but the, the, you know, the, to, to end that in the days before COP26 to, to announce this kind of with a flourish, this cut in air passenger duty. Interestingly, I think the changes that the Chancellor has made to air passenger duty in the round, because the other thing that he announced alongside that was an increase in air passenger duty for long haul flights, uh, probably reduce emissions. The other reason why they reduce emissions is because if you increase domestic flying, uh, then you reduce the availability of credits under the emission trading scheme. So you probably he's probably made electricity more expensive, interestingly, for you as a consumer by cutting uh, air passenger duty. The point is that these things are all interrelated. The Treasury does take a view on this. Um, but they don't publish uh, any kind of impact assessment uh, for the budget overall. Now, they do look, obviously, at the fiscal implications of budget decisions, and I think it would be good if they published something that looks at the carbon implications as well. We may, be, may eventually get to a point when the Treasury was able to say how it felt that the carbon budgets should be met. It is, after all, a budgetary issue. So I think more and more the Treasury needs to be better and more transparent at explaining how the decisions it's taking in these budgets and spending reviews add up to something that fits with net zero. James. Yes, I think there's an interesting point that Chris made there around um, you know, the uh, the impact of uh, air passenger duty on domestic flights, uh, the impact that, that has on, on domestic electricity prices for people's homes. And I mean, it's just a good, it's an anecdote, but I think it's quite revealing. And that's actually a point that I made during a second reading speech um, last week, you know, sort of saying this is all connected. You know, if you if you uh, cut uh, air passenger duty on domestic flights, it feeds back and actually can push up domestic energy prices, electricity prices. I think the IFS 
they did some work on that, um, which which suggested that would be the case. Um, and the Treasury ministers um, on the other side all kind of looked shocked and shook their heads and said, mm, no, it doesn't, no, it doesn't. You know, and I think, you know, that may be they were unaware or, or, or the, the theatre of politics in the chamber. Um, but it sort of just struck me there isn't that sort of, uh, you know, global view or even sort of with, within Britain comprehensive view about how all these policies um, interact with one another. Um, and that's what we really need to make sure there is that comprehensive plan that people can trust in. Thanks, James. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. So apologies to those of you who sent in questions that we didn't manage to get to. There are lots of excellent ones still there. Thank you very much to all of our panellists today, to James, David, Chris and Amanda for their excellent contributions to the discussion. And thank you to Deloitte for sponsoring this event. If you are interested in further reading on net zero and the tax system, do take a look at our recent report that's available on our website. And thank you all very much for watching and please do join us again soon for another IFG event. Thank you.